Hi, today we're going to get into Automatic 11.11 and all the things that you see on the front page. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but it took me a long time to understand what all these little things do and how to use them to my advantage. So today we're going to go over it. All right, let's get into this. An Automatic 11.11 is based off of Stable Diffusion. Now, Stable Diffusion is where you type in your text prompt. That then goes to what they call Clip. Clip is the interpreter for your text prompt into information that the image generator can understand. Once you've entered your text prompt and hit generate, it then goes to Clip. Clip then takes your words, translates them into something Stable Diffusion can understand, and Stable Diffusion then starts with an image full of noise. Now this round trip happens a lot between Clip and your text prompt and the images. It's constantly, Clip is checking on the text prompt to make sure it's getting things right. It's checking on the image to make sure the image is getting things right. And slowly but surely, your image starts to come out of the noise. And when you're done, you have a cute picture of a puppy with a party hat on. Now that we understand what Stable Diffusion is and how Clip integrates with Stable Diffusion, let's go ahead and go on to some other things. First off, there's the term data set. What is a data set? A data set is a collection of images that are then used to make a model. This is what a model is the base template that you use to create any image. This one just happens to be of dogs in party hats. Then we go on to what a fine-tuned model is. A fine-tuned model is you start with a model just like this, and then let's say you want to narrow the parameters. Let's say you want only black dogs with party hats on. So you take a bunch of black dogs images, and then you give them a weight. A weight in stable diffusion or in within a model is basically how great of a chance that image has of influencing the outcome. If I give a higher weight rating to the black dogs, then the chances are higher that when you generate a picture of a dog with a party hat, it's going to be a black dog rather than any other color. So you take your images, you then add them to the model with greater weights, and then you have a fine-tuned model. Next, we have LoRa, or Low Rank Adaption. What a LoRa is, is it's a controller. It basically controls your image in certain ways. It can control the style of the image, it can control the type of character that the image is, or it can control the theme. It, for example, if you're creating an anime or photorealistic image, or you want to use Dragon Ball Z or runway models, or if you want something in black and white or cyberpunk, Loras can control what the image does as far as an effect. Now, Loras are a add-on to your model. They can run alongside your model, and you can either turn it on or off. And it's done this way because it gives you much more flexibility with your model. You can try different LoRa's with your model to get different types of effect without affecting your overall model. Next, we have merged models. Now, when you merge models, you're going to assign a weight to each one. It's very similar to what we did with fine-tuned models, but instead of focusing the model, you're adding more functionality to the model. So, for example, if we start off with our model of the dogs here and we want to add some cats in party hats, then we can take those two models and we can merge them together. Now you have a chance to create dogs in party hats and cats in party hats. Then we have pruned versus unpruned or normal models. Now, what is the difference between these two? For the pruned model, this is a smaller model than the unpruned one. Hence, you prune a bush and you get a smaller bush because you cut off branches. And the advantage of being a pruned model is that it runs faster, it's a smaller file, but it does come at a cost. And that cost is removed weights. We'll get to that in just a moment. And when I say faster, I mean that it will generate the image faster than a unpruned or normal model. Now, for unpruned models, you have several different features here. Unpruned models are better for training. We'll get to that in just a second. They are a larger file size, and they also run slower. When I say slower, I mean when you go to generate an image, 
they will generate typically slower than a pruned model. However, if you want to use that model for merging or training another model, then you want the unpruned version because the weights within the normal model are very important when you're training other models or merging other models into your original model. So if you plan on doing merging, go with the unpruned version. If you plan on not doing merging and you don't care about that, go ahead with the pruned version. Unpruned models also work better with fine-tuned models. If you plan on fine-tuning your model or merging your model, unpruned is the way to go. Next, we'll get into embeddings or what they're called textual inversions. Now, you have your model and then you want to include other images to expand the model. You don't want to focus it down, but you want to expand it just like we did with merging models. However, there's one key difference here that doesn't necessarily happen when you merge models. When you're doing an embedding, you can also include keywords that aren't necessarily in your main model. So for example, if you wanted horses with party hats, you could then add pictures of horses with party hats, and you can also include keywords for those horses. Now, just like the LoRa, the embeddings run side by side with the model. So you can turn them on or off or use different embeddings and it allows you to have greater flexibility, greater range of types of images that you can create. Next, we have CFG versus VAE. Now, CFG is fairly simple. It stands for creative, yeah. Now, CFG is fairly simple. If I could say it simply, CFG is fairly simple. It means creativity factor. So basically you have a scale that goes from one to, I think it's 20. And the lower the number, the higher freedom you give to stable diffusion to modify your image the way it sees fit. The higher the number, the more it restrains itself to what you have in the text prompt. A typical good value for a CFG scale is somewhere between six and 10. If you go any higher or any lower, you can get some very odd results. Now, VAEs or variational autoencoders. VAEs are, again, very similar to what we saw with LoRa's, but they do a different set of features. For example, compression. It can actually take the image that you're creating and make it a smaller file size. If you're trying to save on space, it's a good thing to have. Denoising. Denoising basically cleans up your image. If you notice, there's a checkbox on uh, Stable Diffusion saying restore face. And if you check that box, it'll clean up the face and make it look as normal as it can. However, with a VAE, it's not just limited to faces. You can have it affect any type of portion of the image or the overall image as a whole. It can also, it can also force your image to portray a certain character. Now that character may have modifications made to it via your text prompt. For example, if you want all your images to look like Drake, but you want to have them wearing different clothes, then you would get yourself a Drake VAE, and every one of your images would come out looking like Drake. And yes, I had to look up to see who Drake was. Anyway, it can also do style transfer, which means it can also dictate the type of medium that your images are created in, whether that's paintings or photographs or cartoons, etc. As you can see, it's very versatile. And VAEs, just like Laura's, work alongside your model. So you can have a model and a VAE and a LoRa and an embedding all running simultaneously doing different things to enhance your model. So it allows for a whole bunch of flexibility and modifications that you can create. And then we come to tiled diffusion and controlled net. Tile diffusion is pretty simple. Basically, when you create an image, it's going to look at that image and make sure that it can be continued in any direction without any seams. Somewhat similar to like if you're making wallpaper or some other printed design and you want to keep it looking like one big image rather than small images all put together. So tiled diffusion works on that. There's also tiled VAE, which is a VAE just for tiled diffusion models. Then we have control net. Control net is kind of new to stable diffusion. It's a great tool set to have. What it can do is it can take a picture that you give it and then transfer that pose to the image that you're making. So for example, if you want to make a picture of a robot doing a handstand, you can take an image of a person doing a handstand, put it in control net, and then you generate your picture and voila, you have a robot doing a perfect handstand. It also does depth mapping, 
which can be very useful if you're trying to make a more 3D style image. Now, Control Net is a monster in and of itself, and I am planning on in the near future creating a video just on how Control Net works because it has a lot of functions, a lot of different pieces that you can put together that makes it really, really useful when you're generating images. There's also a thing called image to image. Image to image on some layers is similar to Control Net where it's using a picture that you provide as guidelines for the image that you're creating. However, it is not trying to copy the pose and it's just using that image as a guideline. So for example, for example, if you wanted to put a picture of you in armor, you would upload a picture of yourself and then in the text prompt, you'd say, you know, person wearing armor and then you hit generate and it will create what it thinks is you in armor. However, it's not precise. You may get something close but the chances of getting something that looks exactly like you is very minimal. There are ways to do this, but that's something that we want to include in a later video because it's quite complex. It's basically, you make a model of you and we'll, we'll get into that in a future video. Next, you have negative prompts. Negative prompts are basically everything you don't want in an image. For example, double heads, long necks, or the color purple. But remember, negative prompts are like teenagers with chores. You can tell them to do something specific, but they might just forget. You want to encourage stable diffusion to remember certain prompts over other ones. And the way you do that is by putting brackets or weights on a negative term. For example, if you have a negative term of double heads and you really, really, really don't want double heads, you would put a parenthesis on either side or a bracket on either side. And within those uh, brackets, you put the words double heads and you could put a space and then put a weight. A weight is anything ranging from one, which is a normal weight, to two, which is the highest level of importance. Basically, you want to keep them around 1.3 to 1.6, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then stable diffusion will be sure to assign higher priority to those particular negative prompts. Now for everybody that's going along with this and don't know what negative prompts to include, down in the pinned comment, I'm going to include my base level negative prompt that I use for everything. And then I modify it depending on the circumstances. So you'll have something to work from if you don't have anything already. And then we get to scripts. Scripts are kind of cool. Scripts are built in additional tools that add some type of functionality. For example, there's the XY plot script. And what this does is allows you to create a matrix of, of images based on different attributes. So for example, we were talking about CFG earlier, where you wanna see what it does with your image if you give stable diffusion a lot of uh, freedom and what it looks like if you don't give it any freedom at all. So you can actually say, create me four images that have a CFG scale of six, one of seven, one of eight, and one of nine. And then you'll be able to see them right side by side, exactly what they're gonna look like. So you know where your image is headed depending on the CFG scale that you select. So those are some of the things you can do. You can also do play with, around with steps. Now steps we haven't really talked about, but I'll get into that real quick here. Steps are how many times you want to try to create your image and make it better. Now there's a, uh, you can set that number anywhere between one and I think it's 200. The basic range is anywhere between 20 and 50. Um, it all depends on the type of image that you're creating. I tend to go around 40 as a step level, but what you can do with the XY plot script is you can say, give me one image at 20, one image at 30, one image at 40, and one image at 50. So you can see what the different step levels will do for your particular image. At a certain point in the number of steps, there's a diminishing return. And sometimes it can even screw up your image because it's trying to basically overthink. So as I said, 20 to 50 is a range. I normally go for 40. Then we come to in painting. In painting is a video in and of itself, but basically it gives you the ability to expand your original image. So if you think about this and you say, okay, my image is this big and the canvas it's sitting on is three times bigger. So you have all this blank space around your image. You can use in painting to fill the rest of that canvas in any direction you want, and it will use your original image as a basis for what to fill in those missing pieces with. And there's a lot of different subtleties to it, so this will be a video in the future all by itself. Another thing that uh, in painting can do is it can modify your existing image. So for example, if you create a picture of a model and that model has brown eyes and you want the model to have blue eyes, you could go in with in painting 
and replace just the eyes on your image. So now you're saying, okay, where do I get these lures? Where do I get these embeddings? Where do I get these models? Where do I get all the stuff you've been talking about? That comes from three main sources. First, there's Hugging Face, which is huggingface.co. Then there's Civit AI, which is civitai.com. Fair warning, if you go to that page, the front page is generally not safe for work. So be careful where you open that page at. And then you have GitHub, which is github.com. GitHub.com is for far more than just stable diffusion files. So it can be, any one of these can be a maze in trying to figure out what you want to find and where it would be. I recommend very highly starting with either Civit AI or Hugging Face. Their user interface is much friendlier, but some of the better tools tend to be on GitHub. And if people are interested, I can make a video about going in depth on how to find things within these various tools. So if you want that, let me know down in the comment. And now for those of you who stuck around this long, we're gonna get into a bonus round, styles. This is something that's built into Automatic 11.11 or any of its particular derivatives. So let's get into that. When you go to Automatic 11.11, you have two basic boxes that are your most important ones. You have the positive prompt box, which is up top, and the negative prompt box, which is down bottom. Now, typically when you're starting off fresh, you, this will be blank and you would have to go in here and enter in every one of your negative prompts by hand. Or in some cases like I used to do, I would keep these in a Word document that I could just cut and paste. But with styles, there's an easier way. Once you have your negative prompts in here, you can click on this button underneath the generate, the far one to the right, that says save style. And when you click on that, it will come up here and will give you a chance to name this. So if I wanna say uh, negative prompts, I can click on okay. I click on my refresh button. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna erase all this. So you come in here, it's all blank, go over to styles, click on down here, select negative prompts. And then the second button from the right says apply selected styles to current prompt. And you just click on that and all of your negative prompts are automatically entered for you. You can have a bunch of different ones that you can choose from and it will automatically paste in those negative prompts for you every single time. Also, if you have a, a regular prompt that you want to go with, you can type in that regular prompt here. Now I can save this and I can go R prompt and I say, okay. And then again, you come in here, you got blank screens. You go over here, you choose R prompt. You then click on load those and boom, your positive and negative prompts are automatically loaded for you doesn't get any easier than that. And I want to thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. If you want to get a hold of me on Instagram or Twitter, my handles are always AI John Art. So I look forward to hearing from you in the future. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please do leave them down in the comments. I always love hearing from you guys. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.